Hello and welcome to the final day of Easy 2021. And my name is Ezra and I'm part of the team here in Explain Apologetics. And on behalf of the team, we just want to thank you for being here. And surely um, it's another exciting day with a special debate on whether Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. Now, before we move further with the debate, I just want to give out some ground rules for us. Uh, and first, we request that you mute your audios throughout the session. And second, if you have any question for any of our debaters, you can log on to Slido. And the link to Slido is on the chat box by, and you can address um, your questions by addressing a particular debater by their first name along with your questions. And I will be taking them for the Q&A session at the end of this night. Third, uh, please take note that our sessions will be recorded and if you want to have the recordings, uh, you can request from the team, but we kindly ask that you do not share it around or in the public as our recordings are only for the exclusive use of those who paid for this conference. Fourth, be graceful, be respectful in all interactions. We welcome any questions in regards to uh, whatever topic that has been addressed. And we understand that by nature, some questions may be offensive, but we kindly ask that you conduct yourself with grace and humility. And last but not least, if you have any questions or suggestions uh, for the team, you can always come to me or the Explain Apologetics team. And you can always write to us at explainapologetics at gmail.com. I repeat, write to us at explainapologetics at gmail.com. And once again, if you just made it here, on behalf of my team in Explain Apologetics, welcome to the final day of EZ 2021. We have a special debate on whether Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. And I would like to introduce the debaters. And first, we have Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, who is a Christian scholar, international speaker, and debater. He holds a bachelor's degree in forensic biology, a master's degree in evolution, uh, evolutionary biology, a second master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience, and a PhD in evolutionary biology. And currently, Jonathan is an assistant professor of biology at Sattler College in Boston in Massachusetts. He's also working on his Master of Arts in Biblical Studies at Southern Evangelical Seminary. And Jonathan has been interviewed on podcasts and radio shows, including Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio, Line of Fire Radio by Bishop Robert Barron, The One Minute Apologist Show, and many others. And Jonathan has spoken internationally in Europe, North America, and South Africa, promoting an intelligent, reflective, and evidence-based Christian faith. And against Dr. Jonathan would be Tom Jum who runs a YouTube channel where he debates professors, philosophers, and theologians about the reasons to believe in God. He wrote an epistemology and model morality, which he uses as a basis for his arguments in his debates with many of the most prominent academics in apologetics, uh, ranging from cosmology, history, biology, psychology, philosophy, and many other fields. So Dr. Jonathan McClatchy will be, will be facing against Tom Jum, and this debate will be moderated by Brendan Lowe, who is a second year law student in the University of Cambridge, who is also an apologist, enthusiast, aspiring legal academic, and a proud Malaysian. Now, I may pass this time to the moderator. Over to you, Brendan. Hey, everyone. As Ezra introduced, my name is Brendan, and I'll be the moderator for today. And I'll just start by explaining the format of the meeting, of the debate. Um, so here, here it goes. The format of the meeting has five sections, namely opening, a rebuttal, cross-examination, conclusion, and the Q&A. I will be providing an explanation for each section when we reach the relevant section. For now, I will start by explaining how the timing works. Each side will have 20 minutes for the opening, 15 minutes rebuttal, cross-examination, 15 minutes as well, eight minutes for the conclusion, and we'll end with the Q&A for the remaining time up until 10.55 p.m. Malaysian time. Um, 
each debater in the team um, may would be using all the time as they wish, but of course may end earlier if they would if they like to. As for the timing, I will provide some indicators whenever the time is up, namely at one minute and when when we have run out of time. I'll be using two devices to indicate this time, namely a bell and a visual aid that looks like this. One minute and time's up. So I'll ring the bell once like this when there's a minute left and twice when we're out of time. When I ring the bell the second time, it will be highly appreciated if both debaters um, would stop speaking at the time. And so um, YC, it would be good to start wrapping up your arguments once you hear the first bell. Um, I'm going to be have I'm going to have to be rather strict on time in the interest of the debate flowing smoothly, but I hope that the points not managed to raise, not managed to be raised in the particular section would be able to be raised in a later section. Also, I would apologize in advance if either the sound of the bell is not picked up or you're unable to see the sign. I will do my best to make sure they are both heard. Um, however, if they are not, if the bell is not heard or if the indicator is or if the sign is not seen, we will need to move along as though the sound had been heard or the indicator had been showed in the interest of the debate moving along smoothly. Um, before I will go into the net, into the specific sections of the opening, um, just want to check, does any of the debaters have any questions? All right, I will explain the opening in brief and then I will hand it over to um, the debaters Firstly, with Don, um, Dr. Malachi and then Tom Jump. Okay. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'll just hand it to, I'll pass it the time to Dr. Malachi and your timing starts on your first word. Okay, uh, well, hopefully you can see this. So, um, so thank you um, everyone for, for attending tonight's debate. And, uh, and I especially would like to thank Tom Jump for agreeing to participate in this evening's discussion or this morning's discussion, depending on where you are in the world. So um, the question that was before us today is, did Jesus fulfill prophecy? Um, and I want to begin by um, uh, talking about how we should think about evidence. And uh, here we see uh, a courtroom and I want you to imagine that the forensic scientist comes forward in the courtroom and presents the uh, murder weapon that was involved in committing the murder uh, that the person is charged with and he points out that the um, the murder on the handle of the murder weapon are the accused's fingerprints. Now the presence of the accused fingerprints on the murder weapon is evidence for the guilt hypothesis over the non-guilt hypothesis by virtue of the fact that it's more probable given the hypothesis of guilt than given the falsehood of that hypothesis. And therefore, although it doesn't prove that the defendant is guilty, it nonetheless provides evidence for that because the presence of the accused fingerprints on the murder weapon is more probable given guilt than given non-guilt. And so that's how I think that we, that's how I propose that we think about evidence. How though do we measure the strength of a particular piece of evidence? Well, I would argue that the strength of the evidence for a proposition is best measured in terms of the ratio of two probabilities. That is the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis and the probability of the evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis. Um, and uh, so th th that ratio may be top heavy, in which case E favors H. It might be bottom heavy, um, in which case E favors non-H, or neither, in which case E favors neither hypothesis, and we would not call it evidence for or against H. Um, and uh, note that the probability of the evidence given your hypothesis does not need to be high for the data to count as evidence in favor of your hypothesis. Rather, the probability of the evidence only needs to be higher on the truth of the hypothesis than on its falsehood. Let me uh, talk a little bit about cumulative cases and how the, the, these work in probability theory. Suppose that the probability of a piece of evidence, we'll call it E1, given the hypothesis is 0 0.2, but the probability of that same evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis is 0 
then the ratio of that probability of that evidence given the hypothesis against the probability of that same evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis has the value of five to one or just five. That is a, a likelihood ratio that measures and quantifies the strength of that particular piece of evidence. Five such pieces would yield a cumulative ratio of 3,125 to one. If the initial ratio were two to one, 10 pieces of independent evidence would have a cumulative power of more than a thousand to one. Thus, small pieces of evidence, no single piece by itself of very great weight, can combine to create a massive cumulative case. Um, and so if there, there are multiple pieces of independent evidence, their power accumulates exponentially. Now, let me uh, give you um, uh, an, a little introduction to Bayes' theorem. This is the, the, um, the, uh, likely, the likelihood form of um, Bayes, uh, the, the odds form of Bayes' uh, theorem. And uh, um, don't freak out by the, by the math equation. I'll try and explain it clearly. So um, here on the left, we have the posterior probability, the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence against the probability that the false of the hypothesis given the same evidence. So this is expressed as a likelihood ratio. Um, that is equal to what's known as the prior probability, which is the probability um, of the hypothesis just given the background information and the um, pro um, multiplied by the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis against the probability of that same evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis. So, um, so, uh, so this is the uh, equation that's used in developing cumulative cases. So translated, it basically states again, that the, the posterior probability of your hypothesis H given the available evidence E is equal to the prior probability, which is defined as intrinsic plausibility of the hypothesis being true, expresses a ratio multiplied by the ratio of the evidence given the hypothesis against the probability of the evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis. Now, an important consideration here is that the probability of the correctness of my interpretation of a prophetic text does not need to be close to one in order for a prophecy to have evidential value. So for instance, um, if we have a prophecy that um, so let's say that we have an event which has a, a one in a thousand probability of, of happening um, on the background information. But let's suppose that, um, that we are only 10% confident that our interpretation of that particular prophetic text is true. Then that still uh, yields a likelihood ratio of 100 uh, to 1 or a base factor of 100. So you don't, uh, the probability of the correctness of my interpretation of the text does not need to be close to one in order for a prophecy to carry evidential value. Let me uh, then give you six examples where I think we have a strong case for, um, for uh, the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. Um, so let's start with Jesus' death at the time of Passover. So in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, um, Paul mentions, Paul um, says, Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And the um, a common theme throughout the New Test Testament is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb during the exodus from Egypt. Uh, the um, the uh, people, uh, the, the Israelites smeared the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. Um, and that was the signal for the angel of death to pass over those homes and, uh, um, not, and, and spare the life of the firstborn of those households. And so the, uh, the blood of, of Christ is figuratively speaking smeared um, on the doorposts of our hearts and therefore uh, God's wrath passes over us just as he passed over the, the, those households that had the lamb, um, bl lamb blood smeared on the doorpost during Passover. And it's quite striking then that Christ's death happens to correspond to uh, the, the feast of Passover. Jesus' death takes place on the 15th of Nisan on the day of Passover. Given the theolog theological import of that, that is a, quite a striking coincidence. What though is the evidential value the evidential significance of this? Well, um, I, I would argue that um, there's good evidence that Jesus died on, was crucified on Nisan 15th. There's uh, plenty of evidence for that, such as um, the, the fact that all four gospels mention that. There's various minor peripheral details which are tied up with Jesus' death at the time of Passover and, and, uh, and so forth. So we have independent attestation um, in regards to Jesus' death at Passover. Um, so I, I would argue that there is uh, sufficient reason to conclude that Jesus was, in fact, crucified on Nisan 15th on the day of Passover. Um, now, given the theological import of Jesus' death on the day of Passover, this is a striking coincidence, which appears to be at least somewhat more probable given Jesus' messianic identity than on the falsehood of that hypothesis. Um, so I'm just going to assign what I consider to be a conservative base factor of 10 for this correspondence. So that means that it's 10 times more probable given uh, the hypothesis of Christianity than given its falsehood. 
Let's take another example. Um, according to um, Psalm 22, verse 12 to 18, uh, th th this is um, uh, an excerpt from Psalm 22, which written about 1000 BC appears to depict uh, a crucifixion scene. Um, and this is an excerpt from it. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shared and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones to stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, um, Many scholars have noted that there are various features of this uh, scene in Psalm 22, which um, bear striking resemblance to a crucifixion scene. For example, the dislocation of bones, heart failure, lack of strength, dehydration, the piercing of the hands and feet are all apt descriptions of a crucifixion scene, not to mention the dividing of his garments and the casting of lots. Uh, crucifixion victims would be stripped naked as part of their humiliation. And this execution is al also appears to be public since people stare and gloat over him. Um, there's also um, various um, clues that this is indeed a, um, a messianic text. For example, Psalm 22, verse 6 says, um, but I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people, um, which uh, parallels Isaiah's language in Isaiah 53, 3, speaking about the Messiah, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from him men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So um, in a paper published in Philosophia Christi, uh, which is a philosophical journal, uh, my colleague, Dr. Lee McGrew, um, argues that, um, that, a gener that it's generous to estimate as one in a thousand the probability that Jesus would be crucified based simply on his being a Palestinian Jewish male teacher who was born and died at approximately the time that he did. I'm happy to talk about um, how she arrives at that number if, if desired, but let's just take that, um, that value that she offers. Well, let's assume that our confidence that Psalm 22 is messianic and describes a crucifixion scene is as low as 10%, so 0 0.1. I think it's a very plausible um, postulation that it is indeed messianic. Well, a conservative estimate for the probability of the crucifixion, um, according to Dr. McGrew, is approximately 1 in a, uh, one, uh, in a thousand. This yields a base factor then of 100. So, so far then, our cumulative base factor, based on the two pieces of evidence that we've considered, is 10 times 100, or 1,000. Let's take a third example, Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. This is in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Um, and of course, there's, I, I think there's good evidence that uh, Jesus... Um, was born in Bethlehem. Um, so what's the evidential significance of this? Well, to be conservative, I will assign a base factor for Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to 1,000. Um, this is a generous base factor since clearly much, much less than one out of every 1,000 individuals that have been born since the time of Micah have been born in Bethlehem. And the probability of Jesus, in fact, being born in Bethlehem on the hypothesis that he is indeed the Messiah based on the prophecy of Micah 5 verse 2 is very high, uh, approaching one. Um, and uh, the conservativeness of the base factor reflects also our, our lack of certainty regarding Jesus' place of birth, since I believe it is significantly more likely than not that Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem. This seems a reasonable base factor to me. Uh, so far then, our cumulative base factor is 10 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 1,000, which is 1 million. Um, another example is the spread of Christianity. Um, Isaiah 49 verse 6 um, speaking of the Messiah, says, he said, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Um, furthermore, Jesus himself in Matthew 24, verse 14 says, this gospel of the kingdom will be, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So therefore, on the hypothesis that a given individual is the promised Messiah, the probability that they would bring representatives of all nations of the world to worship the God of Israel is approximately equal to one. Whereas on the hypothesis that Jesus is not the Messiah, the probability is vanishingly small. Uh, in all history, uh, only Jesus has accomplished this feat. Um, so I will assign a conservative base factor of 100 uh, for that uh, particular um, fulfillment. So at this point then, our cumulative base factor is 10 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 1,000 multiplied by 100, which is, is 100 million. Um, another example um, uh, is that Jesus uh, was Jewish. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 
verse 15, we read um, Moses speaking to the people, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And of course, Jesus um, is Jewish, which uh, fulfills that prophecy. So the Jewish population of the world in the first century um, ha has been estimated to be around 4.2 million, although this figure is probably excessive. Um, and estimates uh, for the total world population in the first century range between 150 and 330 million. So I'll take the most conservative figure of 150 million, which yields a probability of being Jewish of 0 0.028. That yields a base factor of around 35.7. However, for the purpose of my analysis, I will assume a base factor of only 10. Thus, our cumulative base factor thus far is 10 times 100 times 1,000 times 100 times 10, which is 1 billion. Um, sixth example is the destruction of the Jewish temple. This is from Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 26, which uh, speaking um, is concerning the Messiah. I'm happy to defend that this is indeed messianic. It says 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going of the, out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a Mashiach, a prince, there should be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it should be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, Mashiach, Mashiach, Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Um, that this text is messianic is supported from the reference to the timetable of 70 weeks or 77 as it's often translated being decreed for the purpose of finishing transgressing transgression putting an end to sin uh, atonement for iniquity bringing in everlasting righteousness sealing both vision and prophet and anointing a most holy place those are features usually associated in scripture with the messianic mission uh, following the cutting off uh, um, which is an idiom for killing of the anointed one in verse 26 daniel indicates that a ruler shall come and destroy the city and sanctuary the fact that the city and temple were destroyed within only a generation of jesus death is thus of evidential value um, and of course this is something that jesus himself predicted as well and um so in mark 13 verse 1 and 2 it says as he as he came out of the temple one of his disciples said to him look teacher what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings and jesus said to him do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And in fact, this is fulfilled very literally because while the temple burned, the gold that covered the east wall was melted into the cracks of the stones in the pavement. In order to get at the precious metal, the Romans tore uh, the temple and the, the paving apart stone by stone. So when Jesus said that not a single stone will be left stacked, this is not an exaggeration. Um, so what's the evidential significance, though, of this? So to be conservative, I will assign a base factor for, for this fulfillment of only 10. Uh, this takes our cumulative base factor to 10 times 100 times 1,000 times 100 times 10 times 10, which is 10 billion. So let me then do a final analysis. And Brenda, how long do I have left? You have four and a half minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so let me do a final analysis. So our cumulative base factor from the six examples considered in this presentation is 10 billion. That means, given the assumptions I made about the relative weight of each piece of evidence, this evidence is 10 billion times more likely if Christianity is true than if it is false. Uh, it is necessary when doing uh, a Bayesian analysis to give an estimate of the prior probability. Um, the prior probability relates to the intrinsic plausibility of a proposition before the evidence is considered. Um, so, and um, priors can be established on the, on the basis of past information. So for example, um, suppose we want to know the odds that a particular individual won last week's Mega Millions jackpot in the United States. Well, the prior probability would be set at something like one in 300 million, since those are the odds that any uh, individual lottery participant chosen at random would win the Mega Millions jackpot. That is a low prior probability, but it could be overcome if the supposed winner were to subsequently you know, quit his job and start routinely investing in private jets, sports cars, and expensive vacations, and so forth. Um, and, and perhaps he could even show us his bank statement or the documentary evidence of his winnings. So these, those different pieces of evidence taken together would stack up to provide powerful confirmatory evidence sufficient to overcome a very small prior probability to yield a high posterior probability that the individual did indeed win the Mega Millions jackpot. Um, uh, so that that's, um, helps to um, explain the concept of prior probability. So if we suppose for argument's sake that the prior probability of God sovereignly orchestrating the history is as low as one in a hundred million, this, um, the, the evidence I've adduced uh, today um, is still sufficient to, um, to overcome that and yield a posterior probability of 0 0.99 of the hypothesis being true. 
This is relevant to developing the case for the resurrection as well, um, because this sort of evidence considered cumulatively significantly increases the prior probability of Jesus' resurrection. That is the probability of Jesus' resurrection just given the background information alone. Um, and the evidence, of course, for the resurrection also significantly in turn increases the prior probability of Jesus being the Messiah and therefore of his fulfillment of prophecy. And so it works both ways. The case from Jesus' fulfillment of messianic prophecy increases significantly the prior probability of the resurrection and the, the evidence bearing on the resurrection increases significantly the prior probability of the um, fulfillment of messianic prophecy. So I will close with that and pass over to Tom Jump. Thank you for your attention. Right, thanks, Dr. Malachi. Um, Tom, uh, it's the same thing, 20 minutes. Um, I'll start the timer on your first word. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, uh, McClatchy, for coming up to debate. Thanks for hosting us. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys again. Uh, so to start my introduction, prophecy would be great evidence. Prophecy is just like science. It's a novel test of prediction where you're saying that you can tell us something about the future before we know it. A model that is able to accurately tell us these things is good evidence that the model corresponds to reality. But there are a few requirements for something to be to qualify as a prophecy, it needs to be asserted as a prophecy. If someone doesn't actually claim this is an event that will happen in the future, then it's just a bunch of vague sounding prose that may happen to correspond to the future. This is not a prediction. This is foreshadowing. You can find this in every single book ever written. You just look in the past for any kind of vague analogy that seems to look like your preferred protagonist and you can find connections with literally anything. It's very easy. This is not a prediction or a prophecy. It's just foreshadowing. Um, to describe future events, you need to be able to identify this as a future event. If you don't do it, it's just listing a whole bunch of things and you can cherry pick the ones that fit your case while ignoring the failures, which skews the, the statistics. In order to accurately calculate the probability of any given event actually being a prophecy, you would have to also include all of the failures. So if this event, which is not claimed to be a future event, is included as a prophecy, well, then you'd have to include all events that were not claimed to be futures events as prophecies as well, and then add those into the probability, which would say that given X number of random statements that don't claim to be future events, what is the likelihood I'll be able to find one that may correspond to a story in the future? And the probability is actually extremely high, which means if the event isn't literally claimed, this will happen in the future. It, the probability of some of them describing uh, one of your protagonists is extremely high. And so none of these count as evidence whatsoever. So the first criterion, it needs to actually say, this is something that will happen in the future to count as a prophecy. The second one is that it can't be something people are trying to fulfill after the fact. If you say, uh, the, the Messiah is going to come from a city, then anyone who wants to be the Messiah or you want to be the Messiah, you're going to say is from that city, whether they are or not. If you can't prove the lineage or the genetic composition of the person to actually show they were from that place, then pretty much everyone could just claim they're from there if they want to be the Messiah. And so it's not a prophecy. It's just making a goal for people to fulfill that they already want to fulfill. And so you're going to get a lot of claims that people were from that location. Uh, it must. The third criteria is that it must be precise. It has to be very specific. It has to say something that can't be interpreted in a million different ways, because if it can be interpreted in a million different ways, that's equivalent to making a million different predictions. And you're simply cherry picking the one that fits uh, your conclusion while ignoring the rest. So if the statement can be interpreted in a million different ways. You have to include all of the failed interpretations as evident against your hypothesis. So just like the example before, if you were only selecting the one interpretation that happens to fit your story while discounting all the other equally valid interpretations, that's just cherry picking the one that you want to fit your example. Uh, Next criteria is that it must be a novel and un unexpected. Predicting that a city will fall in a Roman empire, which is a warring state, is not novel. It's like predicting the sun will rise tomorrow. It's amazing prediction. I can predict the, predict the sun will rise tomorrow and I'll be right every single day for hopefully many, many years. But that doesn't mean that I'm the son of a god. It just means that I can predict things that everyone already knows because it's already known. In order for a prediction to count as a prediction has to predict something new, something novel that we don't 
know yet. Uh, a few comments on Bayesian epistemology. Uh, Bayesian epistemology is like any form of argumentation. It's not evidence of anything. It's just a formulation of your already held beliefs. If you have these beliefs, then you should come to this conclusion. So B does not help you realize, all it does is help you realize the consequences of your already existing beliefs. But most people don't need BE or any formal argumentation to do this. Most people can just already realize the consequences of their beliefs just by thinking about it. So BE really doesn't accomplish much of anything other than just telling you what you already believe in a more formal way. What we care about is the reasons to hold these beliefs. Is it the case that the the this argument is true? I don't care about the number you place on it. It doesn't make a difference one way or the other. If it's not true, well, then it counts for nothing. It's a zero. Um, and when you are assessing the truth of whether or not Jesus fulfilled prophecies, you have to look at the failures. If you don't include the failed prophecies, then you're not accurately assessing the data. You're cherry picking. For example, Jesus prophesied that all over the world will worship him in Isaiah 2.11. That's not the case. It didn't happen. Uh, he prophesied in Isaiah 11, 12, that the Israelites will be returned to Israel. Didn't happen. He prophesied the Jews will experience eternal joy. Didn't happen. Uh, Isaiah 51. He prophesied that the weapons of war will be no more. Ezekiel 39. Didn't happen. He prophesied that all those who died will rise again. Isaiah 26. Didn't happen. Hasn't happened yet. Failed prophecy. Ezekiel 42 clearly defines the third temple as being built by an actual temple, not a body. Didn't happen. Uh, peace all over the world. Micah 4.3. Didn't happen. And Isaiah 2.4. Didn't happen. Uh, not to mention that he can't be a descendant of David because he has no paternal father. He, he was, he's the son of God. He doesn't have a father. How could he be a descendant of David? Um, there's lots of things. He, he, Jesus was never the ruler of Israel. Didn't happen. So he fails all of these prophecies. And if you account any one of these as being even partially true, then Jesus does not meet all of the prophecies of the Messiah. Because each of these are prophecies of the actual Messiah and they fail. So some vague notions about stories that happen in the Bible that may seem kind of similar don't in any way make up for just any one of the abject failures of the prophecies that Jesus doesn't fulfill, which is why Jews don't think Jesus is the Messiah, because he didn't actually literally meet any of the predictions that the Messiah was supposed to meet. So in order for a prediction to count, or a prophecy to count as a real prophecy, it has to be claimed to be a prophecy. It has to say this will happen in the future. It has to be precise. It has to say specifically that a particular event that isn't already known yet or expected is going to happen. And it has to specifically be about the Messiah. Um, if it's not about the Messiah, then it wouldn't count as a prediction that the Messiah fulfilled it because it's just a general prediction. So there's lots of these criteria that need to be met for this to count as a prophecy and a prophecy of the Messiah, none of which are significant in any way to indicate that Jesus fulfilled them at all. And there are many, many failures. So it's there's no justifiable basis to conclude that Jesus fulfilled any prophecies, and none of the prophecies are good anyway. Uh, just to give an example, a very good prophecy or prediction could come from the example of Hinduism, which predicted the age of the earth was 4.3 billion years, which is like within 0.1% of the actual number. That's a very good prophecy or prediction, and they got it right. That is probably the best example of any prophecy I could have ever thought of because it's extremely precise. It's something we don't know yet. It was confirmed and it was made 3000 years ago. It, it's a very, very good prediction. It's still not good enough to indicate Hinduism is true. No, all of the cumulative added up case of Christianity doesn't even come close to that one prediction. And so obviously it doesn't count as evidence that Jesus was true. And to show this is the case, we can take any story or account of historical people and find vague references that seem to indicate that the similarities or future events, for example, the assassins foretold by Moby Dick, Moby Dick, uh, a story, a fictional story about uh, a big whale, predicted the prime minister of India, Gandhi, his death, Prime, the President Rene Mouad's death, the Soviet exile of Leon Trotsk, Trotskoy, the Reverend Martin Luther King's death, the Chancellor Albert Dufus's death, the assassination of Sirhan Sirhan, John F. Kennedy, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and a bunch of other people just by looking through patterns in the text. If you look through a large section of text with lots of different things in it, and then just cherry pick the ones that seem to fit, uh, your conclusion or the one that you want, you can find dozens and dozens of examples of extremely precise predictions. Like these all give dates and years that you can find 
in just a single paragraph if you look for the patterns and none of it's none of it's evidence because you're ignoring all the misses if you use a particular pattern and look for like a direction in a paragraph that this this fits my analogy and you just don't include all of the other interpretations that you could do using the same metric you're cherry picking uh, exact same thing uh pen and i forgot his first first name decided to look for number patterns in the bible and he found a bunch of different consecutive patterns of seven if you just think oh what, are, what is the probability that we would see this under the case that it was written by God, we find all these nice patterns of seven. Well, it's really easy to explain that. What's the pattern that would happen by random jumble mess? Well, very low. So by uh, Jonathan McClatchy's standard, all of these examples would be evidence that Moby Dick can predict the future and that there's a bunch of patterns of sevens in the Bible, which is false. It's just basic mathematics that none of these actually account for any evidence whatsoever because you're discounting all the misses, which far outweigh any of the positives and you would expect that in the noise you would get some hits just by a bunch of random combinations of numerical assessment so none of this accounts as in any way evidence until you have a passage or find some kind of old textbook document that says jesus uh who was born in this year and died in this year was crucified by pontius pilate and etc cetera, etc cetera. and you find a document that says that uh from 4,000 years ago, Jesus didn't fulfill any prophecies. You're just vaguely interpreting what he said in the most general way possible that could be applied to any book to make it seem like it's a future telling of, the, of anything. So I will conclude there. And thanks again for hosting the debate. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Thanks, Tom. I will now pass the stage back to Dr. Malachi for the rebuttal. And you will have 15 minutes. The rules on timing indicators remain the same. Um, I'll start the timer on your first word. Well, thank you, Tom, for that uh, spirited response. Uh, so you said, um, let me just, just address a few of the things you said. So you said that for a text to qualify as a prophetic fulfillment, it needs to, the original text uh, from the Old Testament needs to be asserted to be a prophecy, and it needs to be able to identify as a future event. I actually disagree with this. Um, I think that uh, I, th I think that the strongest examples are those which are asserted to be prophecies, because then you can argue that the probability of the fulfillment, given the truth of um, given the hypothesis of Christianity, is very close to one. Uh, but I, I think that you can also look at retrospective uh, prophecies that are, that are, or or um, fulfillments that are only um, recognized in retrospect, and I think that they can still carry evidential value. So, for instance, I mentioned Jesus' um, fulfillment of the Passover feast. And taking a, a broader construal of prophecy than I think Tom Jump is, um, Jesus' fulfillment of the Passover feast uh, is something which, given the theological import of that, seems to be more probable given uh, the truth of Christianity, because that's uh, something that uh, God might be expected to bring about. At least it's, it's not particularly surprising that God would bring that about, but it is at least somewhat surprising given the falsehood of Christianity. And so I, I assign what I think is a conservative base factor of 10 to that particular fulfillment. Um, which, uh, so it, it carries evidential value, of course, it's nowhere near sufficient on its own to warrant belief in Christianity, but I think it still nonetheless carries evidential value. Um, he says, um, if it's not claimed to be a future event, then ha you have to include all other cases where the text is not claimed to be corresponding to a future event. I, I, I disagree. All you need to show in order for it to carry evidential value is that there's a top heavy likelihood ratio that is more, that the uh, fulfillment is more probable given the hypothesis of Christianity than given the falsehood of that hypothesis. Um, so you don't need to include all the other texts where the text is not claimed to be corresponding to a future event. Um, he says that uh, it cannot be something that people are trying to fulfill. For example, that Jesus would be born, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem because of course Jesus, as he claimed to be the Messiah, is going to claim that he was uh, from Bethlehem. I actually think that we have uh, good evidence that Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem. And um, of course, it's very difficult to control where your, where your birthplace is. But um, when, when we look at the, the gospels, for instance, we see that they, are, they, they show themselves through um, overwhelming, you know, an avalanche of evidence. Um, those of you who were at my talk on Sunday last week uh, will know what I'm talking about. Um, some of the, uh, the, the avalanche of evidence that confirms the uh, substantial trustworthiness and um, grinding an eyewitness testimony of the, of the gospel accounts. Um, and since those uh, gospel authors show themselves to be uh, written by individuals who are close up to the facts, well-informed, individually reliable, that provides um, uh, at least a prima facie basis for trusting those documents, even on matters that we cannot directly cross-check. Um, and so I argue that at least the, the, um, 
birth in Bethlehem is, is at least more probable than not. Um, furthermore, um, when we look at the nativity narratives in Matthew and Luke, we see that they're independent of each other. Um, uh, there is lots of evidence that Matthew and Luke's uh, birth narratives um, are independent accounts. One is not copying the other. Uh, furthermore, um, Matthew seems to be, uh, is, Matthew gives kind of a one-sided perspective from Joseph's and Joseph's perspective, whereas Luke gives uh, one-sided reportage from the perspective of Mary, Jesus' mother. Um, and that um, suggests that Matthew is deriving his material from the eyewitness testimony of Joseph and Luke from the eyewitness testimony of Mary. Uh, furthermore, there is um, um, an extra biblical corroboration pertaining to uh, G uh, Joseph and Jesus and Mary's return from Egypt, where they are going back to Judea, and Joseph learns that uh, Herod Archelaus is reigning in place of his of his father Herod, and so he's afraid to go there, and so he goes via Galilee instead. Um, and it turns out, if you if you were just see this, we learned that uh, Herod the Great, following his death, his territory was divided among his sons. Herod uh, Archelaus bega uh, began to reign in Judea, and um, Galilee was ruled by his younger brother Herod Antipas, and. Um, and we, we know from Josephus, all, uh, so, so that already eliminates why Joseph would go to um, Galilee instead of to Judea. Um, and uh, we also learn from Josephus that um, the following, that one of the last things Herod the Great did before his death was to have some Jews executed for their part in removing the Roman shields from the temple. And then um, after Herod the Great's death, Narcolaus began to reign. You have the influx of Jewish pilgrims coming in for the Passover. And there was a, a mob of Jews that struck up an argument with some Roman soldiers and picked up stems and stoned the Roman soldiers, some of them to death, um, and uh, then ran to the Jewish temple. And Archelaus, um, being enraged at this threat upon his government, rounded up his entire army and sent the entire army upon the Jewish um, temple, surrounded the, temp the temple, wouldn't let anyone leave or enter the temple, and because uh, um, he surrounded the temple with the horsemen, sent the soldiers into the temple and told them, kill everyone you find. And he slaughtered 3,000 Jews that day. And so that illuminates, so you, you can you can understand what, um, you, you can you can picture Joseph returning from Egypt, encountering this mass of fleeing pilgrims coming out of Judea, hearing what just happened right around that time, and thinking maybe it's best not to go into Judea right now. And so he goes via Galilee. So that sort of extra biblical incidental corroboration helps us to have confidence in the uh, reliability of the biblical account. Um, he says that, um, that it, it cannot be interpreted in other ways. So it's got to be, you've got to have a 100% certainty that your, the interpretation is correct. I disagree with that. I even mentioned this in my opening statement. That, um, let's suppose, for instance, that um, our confidence that Psalm 22 is messianic is as low as 10%. Um, but let's, um, uh, uh, and that it's describing a crucifixion scene, let's see it's as less as 10, 10%. Well, um, and let's suppose that the, the probability of, of someone being crucified based on the fact that they're a Palestinian male Jewish leader is something like one in a thousand. Well, that's still a base factor of a hundred thousand divided by 10. Um, so it's, it still can carry evidential value, even if you're not certain in your interpretation. Uh, he says that it has to be um, surprising and unexpected. I, I agree with this. The extent to which it's surprising or unexpected on the falsehood of the hypothesis that relates to the strength of that particular evidence. So remember, we're always trying to measure what is the likelihood ratio, what's the probability of this hypothesis given the falsehood, given the truth of the hypothesis, and what's the probability of that same evidence existing given the falsehood of that hypothesis. And to the extent that that ratio is top heavy, uh, that it's uh, the extent to which is less surprising given that the hypothesis is true than if it were false, that will correlate with how strong that particular piece of evidence is. Um, he says that Bayesian epistemology is not evidence of anything. It only helps to recognize consequences of already held beliefs. Well, of course, Bayesian epistemology is not itself evidence in the same way that mo uh, modus tollens or modus ponens are not evidence of anything, right? They, they are help to structure your thinking as you, are as you are doing a deductive syllogism and you try to work out, okay, what conclusion follows necessarily and inescapably from those premises. Um, and, and just as with deductive logic, with Bayesian epistemology, um, if you insert garbage into the equation, you're going to get garbage out. So, of course, it's dependent upon the assumptions, but it is a way of thinking about clearly uh, um, the, the evidential value of different pieces of evidence and how they stack together to cumulatively form a very powerful case um, in support of a hypothesis. Um, he mentioned that we must uh, include failed prophecies as well, otherwise we are guilty of cherry picking, and he gave a few examples of what he considers to be uh, failed prophecies. Now, um, I actually do consider um, apparently failed prophecies in my analysis. I just didn't have time in my opening statement to, to cover those. Um, but um, I, I would argue that there is um, 
an epistemic quantitative asymmetry in regards to um, the evidential value of fulfilled prophecies and the evidential value of apparently failed ones. And the evidential value of um, fulfilled prophecies, especially if, if it's um, something which is surprising or highly unlikely on the falsehood of the hypothesis, um, is, is comparatively strong evidence that supports the hypothesis. But when, when there are, but apparently failed prophecies, when there are um, alternative interpretations available, uh, that is only weak evidence that tends to disconfirm uh, the thesis. And actually, I have an article on my website, if you're interested in checking this out, where I actually um, walk through this mathematically um, and show that the, um, that, uh, the um, piece for piece um, specific failed prophecy, uh, specific fulfilled prophecies are more um, of, of greater evidential value in confirming Christianity than apparently failed prophecies are in, in disconfirming it. So um, uh, happy to go into more detail on that if required, but I'll, um, I'll stop there and yield the rest of my time. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Malachi. Um, and now 15 minutes to you, Tom, for the rebuttal. I'll start the time on your first word. Sure. So, um, some of the things Jonathan mentioned as his prophecies were that Jesus was the Passover lamb. There is no prediction that the Messiah will be the Passover lamb. It didn't happen. Uh, Jonathan is making an inference that he says, ah, the God in the Bible did this in the past. So he kind of likes this date for some special reason. Therefore, it's reasonable to infer that he's going to do special stuff on this date in the future too. But you can do that with any of the prior actions that the God supposedly did in the past. God smited cities he didn't like. So it'd be reasonable to infer based on his past events, he's going to smite the Romans uh, after they crucified Jesus. Didn't happen. So you can say that, ah, oh, God, a perfect being. Well, if he was a perfect being, he wouldn't drown millions of babies. You would not expect that a God would drown the world and drown millions of babies, but it happened. You can infer that based on the text of the Bible that, well, if you look at the city in the wrong, he might turn you into salt. So, so that's something you would expect. You can infer about any of the different actions that God took in the past and say, well, let's just cherry pick of all these different actions, which ones I think he might do in this case. And if any one of them is true, I'm going to say that one is evidence that this God is real, because if Christianity is true and my interpretation of this, this passage is true, then that one event he's likely to replicate in this one instance, rather than any of the thousands of other things he happened to choose to do in the past. This is cherry picking. You can go through any example in the Bible, look at all the actions God took and infer from those that he will do future things that correspond to those actions. And since the God of the Bible is a mass murdering dictator who's literally done essentially everything, you can just pick whatever you want and assume that, ah, well, I can just pick this particular action. God's probably going to have done it in the past. And so he's probably going to do it in the future. And you're probably going to get something. So there is, this is just cherry picking. You're just picking random events that you think God thinks is important and then saying, well, I think he's going to do it now too. It's, it's the exact same example I used before where you're just looking at random examples of a bunch of stories and then picking the ones that you think fit your story and make your story look powerful. This is why it doesn't count as evidence and it's not a prophecy because all you're doing is inferring from past stories. You cherry pick the story you like and then infer it about the future story. So that doesn't count as evidence. Um, Psalms 22. Like, uh, you've got to pull it up because it's rather long. Many bulls encompassed me. It didn't happen for Jesus. There were no bulls. Uh, their mouths opened wide. There were no bulls. Uh, I am poured out like water. You were bleeding. Wow. Surprise. Any form of death has that. Um, all my bones are out of joint. Wow. Dislocation. Extremely common in every form of torture ever throughout human history. Not surprising. My heart is like mat wax. Oh, you're sad that you're dying. That's that's totally surprising. Clearly, clearly a prophecy here. Um, it's melted in my breast. Oof, that's that's a tough one. Uh, I, I bet no one no one else was ever sad when they were dying. My strength is dried up like like a pot shirt. Well, you're weak when you're dying and tortured and a prisoner. Surprise! This has never happened before. My tongue sticks to my jaw. What prisoners aren't usually fed? Oh wow, it's surprising. Uh, you lay me in the dust of death. Well, where else are they going to bury you? Like maybe maybe like the Vikings, they're going to burn you instead. Pretty much most people take your bodies and you throw it in the dust. That's any form of death. Dogs encompass me. Well, there weren't any dogs. Evildoers. Like, well, sure, everyone would call whoever's killing them an evildoer and probably be right. Um, they have pierced my hands and feet. Oh, that's a good one. You see, that, that one's kind of analogous to, to crucifixion. But it can also be interpreted to be um, uh, apocryphal, just like the dogs and the bulls. So why are we taking this sentence literally and not the other sentences? So, so if you want to say that this sentence, my, I have pierced my hands and feet is a literal interpretation that we should take literally. What's the difference between that statement and the dogs and the bulls? Because 
we could just take those literally and say those were false. So, so clearly not the case. Um, I can count all my bones. Well, I doubt Jesus could count all his bones. Um, and they divide my garments. Didn't happen. I don't, I don't remember Jesus' garments being divided and cast lots for them. That I don't think that happened. So all of those are false. It's like, this isn't a prudent prophecy. It doesn't claim anything that happened about the future. It doesn't say anything about the Messiah. It's just a random event that happened in past stories that you can find a single, essentially a single line that is analogous to Jesus. And the rest of them just apply to any possible death by anyone ever, pretty much. Uh, and then trying to tie this in as to say it's a prophecy when it's not. So none of this, this is, this is a zero. This counts as zero evidence whatsoever uh, because you're, again, taking the hits, ignoring the misses. It's cherry picking. There's nothing here that's evidence of anything. It, again, not a prophecy. Doesn't claim it's going to happen in the future. Doesn't say anything about the Messiah. Most of these things didn't happen to Jesus. If you take them literally, picking the one that, that does literally fit, just cherry picking. None of this counts as evidence. Um, let's see, what else did we pick? Most, so he claimed that uh, Christianity was spread across the world. So most religions claim that. Most religions claim this is the true religion and we're going to spread across the world. Um, this is not surprising. It's not unique. It's every religion predicts this. Every religion predicts some kind of worldwide adherence or worldwide event. Like in Norse mythology, they have a final battle that everyone will be a part of where Thor and Fenrir destroy each other. And so everyone's going to understand or believe at this point, because you're going to be in the battle, whether you like it or not. Everyone makes these kinds of claims. It's not surprising that uh, a religion would be spread across the world. This is not a prediction. It's just what every um, religious person claims about their own preferred religion. Nothing special about this. Jesus was a Jew. You got me on that one. I, I'll grant it. Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. Congratulations. Uh, proof that God, no, no evidence. Not really. No, it's, it's kind of funny. Destruction of the temple. Now that one was actually pretty good. The destruction of the temple prophecy is a decent prophecy. It's saying that there will be a future event that we won't know yet in X amount of years. That's, that's good. That's good. Problem is, is that it's predicting an extremely common event. Rome is a warring state. Cities get destroyed. There are wars that last 50 to hundred years all the time throughout Roman history. This isn't really special. It's just saying the sun will rise tomorrow. Congratulations. Um, giving like a hundred year time period in which a city will be destroyed. Cities really didn't last that long for, for the most of, Roman history. They got destroyed all the time and died from all kinds of reasons. It's not really that special. Um, it's just saying, hey, war happens. Yes. Yes, war happens. This is not impressive. Not an impressive prophecy. Uh, Jonathan mentioned that the Matthew and Luke nativity accounts are both evidence. Well, they, they contradict. The, the stories literally contradict. There is a good account on the Wikipedia page, if you just Google it, that shows the different accounting of the traveling between the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel according to Matthew. It shows the uh, timeline of the events. It shows where they contradict and how they don't uh, match up with each other to show they're actually more likely fictions, which is why most historians consider them to be fictions. Um, Next, a surprising thing he mentioned was that uh, successful prophecies are more important than failed prophecies. Well, if this is a perfect, all-powerful being and you expect a perfect, all-powerful being to know everything, then you expect every prophecy he made to be correct. If a single one is wrong, that would essentially disprove with almost absolute certainty that there is an all-powerful, perfect being. Um, so if there is a single failed prophecy in, the, in a Bible written by an all-powerful, perfect being, it's debunked. That's like a hundred percent failure, right? And that's so any any successful prophecies there don't really matter because your your fundamental claim that you have an all powerful perfect being who knows everything has been falsified. So even if there were successful predictions that were actually great, like in Hinduism, which predicts timeline scales with extreme accuracy and gets most of, a lot of them right, depending on your interpretation, the fact that it gets a lot of other things wrong uh, invalidates those because it's not an all-powerful being. So so it, the failed prophecies, when your claim is so great that there is this perfect being who knows everything, any failed prophecy outweighs any number of successes because it defeats your fundamental claim. Now, if you're just claiming you know a lot or you have a smart guy and he made a couple failures and a whole bunch of successes, that's great evidence that he knows a lot. But if you're claiming he knows everything, a single failure defeats your claim. And so you have to include those prior probabilities about the claim you're making 
into your Bayesian epistemology analysis to realize that actually no, a single failure kind of debunks your whole argument. And I will conclude there. Thanks, Tom. I will now move the session on to the cross-examination. And it will be 15 minutes as well, but the difference is the time will be shared, of course, by both speaker when, when Dr. Malachi is questioning Tom, for example, and Tom is re responding. So um, 15 minutes, I'll pass the time to Dr. Malachi on your first word. You are muted. Just, yeah, just to clarify, um, I, I don't, uh, I'm not saying that there are failed prophecies. I'm saying that there are ones that apparently lack a fulfillment, and there are there are different interpre interpretations of those texts that are available. So to, to show this mathematically, so for instance, let's um, assume that um, um, let's presume that, for example, probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is 0 0.9, and the probability of um, the same evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis is 0 0.999. Um, so thus our, our base factor is 0 0.9, which is equivalent to a base factor of 1.1 against inspiration. So even, um, so and making the problem harder, let's assume that the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is 0 0.1 and the probability of the evidence given the falsehood of the hypothesis is 0 0.999. Thus our, our base factor is 0 0.1, which is equivalent to a base factor of 10 against inspiration. Um, whereas, um, when we're dealing with something that's highly improbable, say that it's a one in a thousand event, but we're only 10% confident in our interpretation, then the base factor is, is 100 to one. Um, and so do you not see there's an epistemic quantitative asymmetry at that point? Uh, no, again, based off of the claim that you're making that there is an all-powerful, all-knowing being, it would change the priors. You would expect that every single one would be perfectly correct. And so any expectation of any failure would have such a low probability that if it occurred, the probability of an all-knowing being is essentially gone. It's zero now because one of one thing didn't occur that was expected to occur. So you're messing with your priors here to get wrong numbers here. You're garbage in, garbage out on your Bayesian epistemology. So um, let's suppose that we have, um, so let's just take an example. So in, in Messianic, in the case of Messianic prophecy, you mentioned uh, in Isaiah Chi and, and other passages, Isaiah 11, that talk about world peace being established by the Messiah. Uh, and that, that is legitimately interpreted as a future event that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Um, or to take a non-Messianic example, it's often pointed out that in um, Isaiah 19, for example, it talks about the, the Nile drying up. Um, and that didn't happen historically, and so therefore it's an argument from failed prophecy. Um, and I have an article addressing this in detail, but an alternative interpretation that's offered by Alec Motier, for example, in his commentary on Isaiah, is that it's talking about Egypt's coming economic decline, and Egypt's economy will take such a hit that it will be as though the Nile dried up, and it's, I think, legitimate to interpret the symbolism, uh, interpret that as symbolic, because Isaiah uses symbolic imagery elsewhere, such as um, people beating their plows into plowshares, and uh, swords into plowshares in Isaiah 2, for example. So, um, a, a, an apparently failed prophecy where alternative interpretations are at least plausible, it doesn't seem to me to be strong at disconfirming evidence. Would you not agree? I would definitely disagree. The fact that alternative interpretations are possible, each of those different interpretations would have to be included in the probability as failures. So, for example, the one about the Nile drying up or whatever, since it doesn't give a time scale in X amount of time, you essentially have infinite time in the future. Eventually, it's going to be true. Like if we imagine the sun uh, expanding in four billion years to a red giant, the Nile is going to dry up. It's going to happen. So, yep, you got that one right. In four billion years, at some point, the Nile is definitely going to literally dry up. Um, does that mean it's a confirmed prophecy? No. It just means that it's a vague prophecy. It means you could interpret it for every single year that humans exist because it doesn't have a limiting factor, which means every single year it doesn't occur is a failed prophecy or has to be interpreted as a failed prophecy because you could interpret the statement as meaning it's going to drive this year or nope, it's going to drive this year or nope, it's going to drive this year. So if you make a prediction like there is a man named Bob standing in, in that direction uh, and you look and travel in that direction and you don't see Bob and I say, oh no, no, he's still there. Just keep looking. Just, just keep looking and you keep looking, don't see Bob. And I just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. You'll not, it's, it's unfalsifiable. You can just keep saying that until you find a Bob. Um, so this claim, that's why prophecies need to be precise if they don't give a precise interpretation. And I didn't say, you mentioned that it has to be, we have to be absolutely certain. We, we don't have to be absolutely certain. It just has to be precise enough that we can infer a reasonable level of uh, certainty about it. We don't have to be certain with 100%. So 
without that level of precision that it gives us some kind of a cutoff point and it's just saying at point x in the future a billion years from now maybe something will happen this isn't the, this isn't the prophecy because it's unfalsifiable it's every single year would have to be counted as a failure because it could be interpreted to mean literally anything in the future so no i wouldn't count that as evidence the fact that you can interpret it to be no no it just hasn't happened yet it's gonna happen in the future it hasn't happened yet especially in the case of like jesus becoming king of israel which he never was he died not king of israel so, so to clarify i i agree with you that apparently failed prophecy is evidence that tends to disconfirm inspiration i just don't think it's as i don't think it's comparably strong though to the evidence that tends to confirm inspiration from fulfilled prophecy so there's what, there's do, you, what do you mean so like if there was an all-powerful, all-knowing being who wrote an inspired book that was essentially infallible, you would expect every single claim that he made to be exact and correct, right? Correct, but there's also alternative interpretations of, of scripture, right? So there's alternative ways of interpreting the text. Right? Sure, so, so, so just using like the example of the Jesus example, Jesus being king of Israel, which never happened. Like he, he lived, he died, he wasn't king of Israel. That would be the, the main one most Jews use as an example to say, Jesus was not the Messiah, he wasn't king of Israel. That one is if, it's valid though for a Christian to interpret that as yet to be fulfilled. Because we believe uh, in the sign. Okay. So you, you, yeah, you could definitely do that. So in science under determination, you can always say that there's other interpretations, but if we apply that logic to literally any other holy book, I think you'll see the issue. If you claim that the Hindu Messiah or uh, the the North North mythology Messiah, uh, some some guy who lived like Ragnar Lothbrok, Ragnar Lothbrok will be the king of um, India essentially. Let's say, say that's a prediction in the text. Well, he died. We know he died, but you can say, ah, the gods may bring him back, and then he may be king of Israel. I mean, clearly this isn't a good prediction. But, but I, I, I agree with you that it tends to disconfirm. I agree with you that it's evidence against, but I argue that it's weak evidence against in comparison to the evidence that tends to confirm. So um, you're imputing to me the view that all the evidence supports my view, and I, I didn't say that. I'm saying that the evidence that supports is, is considerably stronger than the evidence that tends to disconfirm. I'm not sure I'm following. So... If you predict someone will be like, like given our current knowledge, if we predict someone's going to be king and they die, we can use a reasonable level of induction that they're dead. They're not coming back. They didn't get to be king. This was false. Now, of course, you can ad hoc say there's something that could bring him back to life that we have no evidence of and say, ah, it will be fulfilled in the future. We just haven't discovered it yet. Yes, you can do that. But the evidence that we currently have of people die and they stay dead and the evidence of the 2000 years Jesus has stayed dead and has not been king of Israel is a good inductive basis to conclude this prophecy is objectively well, I mean, false. Now, of course, go ahead. I mean, the, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is overwhelming. Um, but, and, and that, of course, raises the prior probability. My, my apologies, like second, the second coming, I think, would be the term I should have said. Yeah, I mean, you said that he stayed dead, and I, I would contest that, of course, but that, that's a matter for another debate. But um, so I, I would agree that it's, it's weak evidence against um but it's not strong evidence could you explain so why are, 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 you, are you familiar with the concept of epistemic quantitative asymmetry uh yes the idea that some kinds of evidence are more important than other kinds of evidence yeah so today to, very quickly to give an analogy um if i see a spider crawling across my desk right now that is very strong confirming evidence that there's a spider somewhere in my apartment but if i don't see a spider in front of me that is that's some evidence against there being a spider in the apartment, but it's very, very weak evidence, right? Sure. Okay, so that, that's the idea of epistemic quantitative asymmetry. And it's the same thing I think applies to prophecy, that specific fulfilled prophecies are comparatively strong evidence that tends to confirm, whereas apparently failed prophecies are, are some evidence against, but, they tend, but they're much weaker than the confirmatory cases. Right, but it depends on the claim. Like if I said there is absolutely 100% no spider in the room, and you see a spider, your claim has been debunked. So if the size of your scope of the claim you're making is sufficient that any kind of small instance could debunk, could debunk it, and the, the scope of your claim in this case is that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, and gets everything right, a single factual error would be extremely strong evidence against that. Um, were, so, I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that there were factual errors in the prediction. I'm saying that, that um, it, it, from the vantage, from 
th th there's an alternative interpretation where it wouldn't right. be an error. But so right. that, that so, so our assessment of the evidential value. Right. So, but it, since you can take any statement and ambiguate it to make it seem like it could be interpreted in a different way, that is more evidence of our psychological proclivity to make things fit rather than the actual way to interpret this is that God got it right. We just don't understand it yet. It's more reasonable to say, no, we understood this correctly when we read it this way and God was wrong. Um, so the fact that there are two separate arguments here. One is that Yes, could there be another interpretation, but is that interpretation reasonable given our current understanding? No, therefore such an interpretation would be unjustified to take simply because it hasn't occurred yet. So to, to take that interpretation while it is possible would, be, would also lower your priors just to adopt that interpretation. So um, I, I, I agree that one can say that a uh, particular scripture seems, or a particular prophetic text seems to be, seems to have failed from the knowledge that we have available to us. And that would constitute some weak evidence that tends to disconfirm. But specific fulfilled cases of prophecy, I think are, are much str um, stronger. And, and actually I, I refer you to my article on this. I think um, it would be instructive for you to read it because I, um, th this, I mean, you're, it, it's mathematically demonstrably wrong what you're, what you're saying. Um, uh, um, obviously not. No. So like if you claim there is an all powerful being and he's going to get the lottery numbers and gives you a list of lottery numbers and the next lottery fails, you can say, Oh no, no, he just meant the next one. Oh, no, no, no. He just meant the next one. No, no. He just meant the next one and say, Oh, he's, he's going to be right in the future. But if given that context, you can, lit you can interpret it with a reasonable s amount of certainty that he meant literally the next lottery thing the numbers he gave you were to win the next lottery and it didn't happen. Therefore, you can say, no, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's wrong. You could also say, no, 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 he, he does know what he's talking about. He just meant a future one, not the next one, the one after the next one or the one after, 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 after the next one. But that isn't reasonable. Anyone who adopts that argument will be considered crazy. Like, no, the, the reasonable interpretation here is that he got the thing wrong. And the same thing would apply to the prophecies in the Bible. There's an all-powerful being who says, I will be the ruler of Israel or I will come back um, like figure what the, the quote is where Jesus says, I will come back within your generation of some kind. And he doesn't come back for 2000 years. It's exactly the same as the guy who said, I'm going to predict the next, the lottery numbers. And you inferring that he means some, one of the ones in the next thousand years that come is going to be the number he predicted. No, that's it's, it's the evidence is against him. He's wrong. You got it wrong. I mean, in, in the case of um, Matthew 24, which you alluded to, I mean, there's, you're familiar with alternative interpretations of that text, which I think are quite plausible, but um, it's, he's, he's, he actually he appears to be setting up the disciples for a long wait. He's, he says there'll be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines, and, but these are not the signs of the end, do not be alarmed. And he um, describes the, 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 the signs that will be the time of the end and says this generation will not pass away until these things are fulfilled, um, which, is, which uh, can plausibly be interpreted to mean that the generation that observes those signs. So again, this illustrates what I'm saying, that that does constitute some evidence that tends to disconfirm, but it's only weak evidence because of the availability of alternative interpretations, especially if we have lots of cases of, of, um, of specific fulfillments, which constitute much stronger evidence piece for piece, at least comparatively speaking. Again, I would just repeat what I've said before. I think that I've already debunked that sufficiently. Well, I think I've already debunked what you said. Um, I mean, you're, you're just mathematically wrong. I mean, um, th this is easily demonstrable. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. Okay. I, 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 think, I, think, I, think you're, I think you're maybe misinterpreting what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm not saying that there actually are cases of failed prophecy and that is only weak evidence. I'm saying that, that um, there, there can be cases where there's an apparently failed prophecy but has alternative interpretations. And that is only weak evidence against, not strong evidence against. Well, so I'm saying any failed test, like if a scientific experiment made a test a prediction that like the Mickelson-Morley experiment, that if we measure the speed of light into going in different directions, we should be able to see differences in speed because of the ether or whatever. And we didn't de detect that. We could say, I don't know. We, we have an alternative interpretation. That, that's not right. The ether is still there. We just 
there's just some funny thing going on. Aliens are messing with our device. And therefore, we're not wrong. And that doesn't disprove the ether. Like any scientific experiment, you can do this for and make up ad hoc explanations of why their prophecy doesn't fail, which is why we require precise predictions that can't be interpreted in lots of different ways. Ad, ad hocness is not always bad. You realize that, right? Um, nope. I think it's pretty much always bad. So there, there's a great paper on this um, published in the technical literature by um, my colleague, Dr. Libby McGrew, uh, where she distinguishes between two forms of ad hocness. There's the, the benign form of ad hocness and there's the bad form of ad hocness. The bad form of ad hocness is where you fail to admit that your thesis is taking a probabilistic hit, but you nonetheless will get ad hoc auxiliary hypothesis. Whereas the benign form of ad hocness is where you are upfront and explicit about the fact that your hypothesis is taking a probabilistic hit, but because you have strong data that tends to confirm your thesis, it's, it's justified to invoke ad hoc auxiliary hypotheses to explain anomalous data that doesn't quite fit the mold of your paradigm. Would you agree with that? Sorry, uh, Dr. Malachi, the time is up. Um, I'll pass the time for the cross-examination to Tom now. And Tom, um, if you like, feel free to continue this discussion with Dr. Malachi. Um, sure, I'll yeah. time you on your first word. Okay. So yeah, I'm just to answer your last question, like, yes, but that does mean that all versions of ad hocness are bad. They, they, as you mentioned, they add a level of disconfirming evidence to some degree, like the amounts, I assume Tim and Lydia McGrew's definition here, I mean, like one would be a, sig a significantly more amount of uh, disconfirming evidence than the other. And they're call calling the one bad and, and one not as bad, but they're both so bad. What, what, so what, what, I, what I'm saying is that we have a well-supported theory and virtually all scientific theories have anomalous data at some level. And if it's a well-supported theory, it's okay, I would argue, to explain away anomalous data to, or to invoke auxiliary hypotheses to account for it within the paradigm, uh, because there's tremendous evidence that supports the paradigm as being true. So even if you don't know how the anomalous data fits with the paradigm, you nonetheless have independent reason to think that it does. Does that make sense? Sure. But is God an all-knowing, all-powerful being who knows everything and is perfect? Yes. And so he can't write a perfect book that is unambiguous, that makes clear sense and isn't vague, like ridiculously vague that can be interpreted in millions of different ways that doesn't even reach even close to the level of a science textbook? Well, mo most of the prophecies that we have are short range predictions rather than long range predictions. And they were made by prophets um, it, for the purpose of um, demonstrating that their message was actually from God. And in fact, Deuteronomy 18 says that if a prophet speaks a word that does not come to pass, then that prophet is not from God. And they need not be afraid of him. They, they spoken presumptuously. And um, and of course, the, the ancient Jews had access to those prophets and could ask them questions and hear them preach, uh, presumably multiple times, hear it said in multiple ways. And so they um, were they had a position of access to those prophets that we do not have. We're reading um, the, the ancient literature, as it were. Um, so um, evidence, uh, so the so um, most prophecies are short range rather than long range predictions, and those are primarily for the people at the time to confirm to them the divine authority of scripture or the divine authority of the prophetic words. Um, right. So if most are short-term prophecies, you could infer like Jesus's prediction that he will come back to the next generation is reasonably also a short-term prophecy. And that has a higher level of probability or a better likelihood that you should interpret the statement in that way than the alternative that it's some future prediction for potential for at least thousands of years in the future. And if that if that could be taken as 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 evidence that tends to disconfirm Christianity, but it's only weak evidence because there's alternative interpretations for it, or at least plausible. So although it provides some disconfirming evidence, it doesn't. It's, it's not a it's not a disproof or a falsification. What theory doesn't have alternative interpretations? Most most uh, theories and most. Uh, hermeneutical approaches to, to scripture are going to have alternative interpretations. And no, I mean, like any, like any scientific, mathematic, what literally what any theory that doesn't have interpret, alternative interpretations. Can you know any of them? Correct. They all do. You're, you're completely correct. Um, but that is, but the, the interpretation of, of text is probabilistic, right? We have a certain probability associated with our interpretation of, of the text. Would you not agree? Sure. I mean, all of, all theories have a probabilistic um, so, so, assessment there. So when when you bring up an apparent failed prophecy, that is some evidence that tends to disconfirm. But it, it on its own, it's not sufficient to disprove. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. We can't 100% falsify pretty much any theory because we could all be in the matrix. We could all have been created five seconds ago by aliens. So, so we could never know anything with certainty. So the question is, 
is a specific fulfilled prophecy of greater evidential value than um, than an apparently failed prophecy, or vice versa. Which would you say? Uh, in well, it depends on the claim. Like if I claim that I am a random human being and I'm just a really smart human being, and I make ten predictions and six of them are correct, that's a perfectly reasonable claim. The, the disconfirming evidence would not be sufficient to debunk my claim that I am a very smart human being. But if I claim I'm an all-knowing, all-perfect, all-powerful being, then anything I claim should come true with absolute unambiguous success every single time the way that the vast majority of essentially the people I'm telling it to are interpreting it. So if I'm an all-powerful, all-knowing being, and I know how most humans are going to interpret this statement, and I present this statement, then the way most humans should interpret it should be the way it happens. Because if it doesn't, and we're just saying, no, nah, it's, it's, it's the way that other people in the future are going to interpret it, but no one literally at the time interpret it, interprets it this way, probably a failed prophecy from an all-knowing being, not all-knowing being. Okay, well, I, I think I've addressed that at nauseum, but is your, is your cross-examination sort of a pretest question? Uh, yeah, so you admit that every, every theory has alternative possibilities, and the, the point is, the important point is which, what's stronger, the confirming or disconfirming evidence. The confirming evidence you presented was a, an analogy between the Passover and Jesus, which isn't a prophecy. Like, why do you think that's a prophecy? Like, was yes, my, I, well, I want to clarify, like, was my description of your argument correct that you are saying that God thinks this is an important date in the past, therefore it's reasonable for me to infer this is an important date in other things he's going to do? No, so uh, the, the argument is that, um, so Jesus is presented in the New Testament as being the fulfillment of the Passover symbolism that just as in the uh, during the exodus the Israelites were to smear the blood of the lamb on their doorposts so likewise um christians are to smear the blood of, of the lamb of jesus figuratively speaking on the doorposts of their hearts so that god's wrath passes over us just as he passed over the hebrews um the fact that jesus death corresponds then to the the day of passover is, is a striking coincidence it's not in its own sufficient to show that christianity is true uh, and i even give it a relatively weak face factor of only 10. um so it's um, so it's it's some confirmatory evidence because it's it's more expected or makes better sense if Christianity is true than the falsehood. At least it's, it seems to be somewhat more surprising given the falsehood of Christianity than given it's true. Um, and there's so, some. So you're inferring from past things in the Old Testament, saying there's a pattern here. We can infer the same pattern about Jesus, and that is evidence in some way. Uh, it, it is evidence because it's more is more probable given Christianity than given this false. Notice that I don't need to say for, for for something to carry evidential value, I don't need to say this is highly predicted given right. the truth of my hypothesis. I just need to show that it's more probable given my hypothesis, or that it's more surprising given the falsehood of the hypothesis. Right. So if we look at the actions of the Old Testament God who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and flood of the earth, we could say it's expected that such a God is going to wipe out Rome for killing his son or essentially something like that. And that would be a reasonable inference to make based off of the past actions of the Old Testament God. And so if that happened and we just saw all of, after Jesus died, everyone was wiped out from Rome, that would also qualify as evidence on your hypothesis if, if it had occurred, correct? Because you're inferring from the past nature of the God and past events that this future event would happen because it's expected under the hypothesis that this kind of a God exists and that event occurred. Therefore, based on your definition, that would count as evidence, wouldn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so because there's nothing that would lead me to believe that such a thing would happen. But given, uh, and you brought up the example of, of Daniel 9, I brought up the example of the statement and responded to it, and that, and with the destruction of the temple in AD 70, that is something which is predicted given Christianity, but it's somewhat surprising given the falsehood. And as you said, it's not, it's not completely at worth the realm of plausibility given the falsehood of Christianity, but it's something that at least is, it's, 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 it's so highly expected given Christianity that it's, it's some evidence that tends to confirm it, which is why I give it a conservative base factor of only 10. Well, so I'm not following here. So, it's expected that God would do the Passover thing, even though he, that's a very rare thing in the Bible, not, not very um, common, but his mass murdering is extremely common, happens all the time it's throughout the Bible. So it seems to me more expected that God's going to mass murder people he doesn't like is something we should expect based off of the Old Testament or should expect significantly more than an analogy to a Passover lamb. So 
if my interpretation is correct, like given my hypothesis that God is a mass murderer and we expect him to mass murder people and we have a very clear pattern of mass murdering in the Old Testament, then it would be reasonable to infer that if there's a whole bunch of mass murdering after Jesus's death or whatever, that would be expected. Like that seems to be a reasonable interpretation of the text. Now, obviously not your interpretation. I, I grant that, but this seems to be a very reasonable interpretation of the text to infer from God's past actions about his future actions. And given your own system of Bayesian epistemology of saying, given the hypothesis is true, we want to assess whether this occurrence is more likely than if the hypothesis is not true. God mass murdering all the people of Rome for killing his son seems to be significantly more likely given the hypothesis is true because past history of mass murder is very common. Therefore, if it occurred, that would count as evidence too, wouldn't it? I think it would depend on the circumstances. So I can imagine certain scenarios in which that would count constitute evidence, um, but you need to go into more specifics about the particulars. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean, like what? So past evidence, yeah. God, God has a tendency to do this. Uh, if we kill his son, we could expect a similar tendency. The tendency occurs. Is that, do you need more? I'm not sure. Like that seems like a clear pattern. It, it, it depends on the particulars of the case and, and how unexpected would be the circumstances given the policy of Christianity and how expected they are they given the, the truth of Christianity. But I, I, I don't like discussing hypothetical scenarios without any particulars. So I'd rather get, to the, get back to discussing the evidence that we actually do have and discussing its evidential value. Well, I think that's what we're doing here. So it seems like you have cherry picked a methodology that could work for literally anything where you just pick a pattern of history of the Old Testament Bible. God has this pattern. I like this pattern. So I'm going to infer this pattern about this event. Therefore, it's evidence. But you could do the same thing. Like you, you literally need to do the, thing, the same thing to the hypotheticals because every hypothetical that can apply the exact same methodology and that you wouldn't count as evidence just demonstrates that you're cherry picking using this methodology for the instances that that indicate your case but dismissing the ones that don't indicate your case so i want to see if i can take the methodology you've presented apply it to the hypotheticals that are false that are clearly not true and see if it would in those cases also apply for evidence because if it was that demonstrates that your evidence only is cherry picking the particulars that you like while ignoring the misses that's i mean that's the point i'm making here so would you say that it's equally probable that um, Jesus' death occurs at the time of Passover, whether Christianity is true or false. Uh, no, but that's not the argument I'm making. So, so my argument here is that, you, well, I'm, I'm claiming that that methodology is just ridiculous in this context. So, so I'm saying that, you're like, saying like it's not equally probable. You must think it's evidence. No. So, so what I'm saying is that I don't care if, because we're assessing a particular truth claim with a particular negative claim, which just isn't evident. It's not evidence to say, if there is a leprechaun in my basement, there is more likely to be gold in the house somewhere because leprechauns like gold. The probability of that being true would, if we found gold in the house, that would be higher, more likely if there was a leprechaun than if there wasn't a leprechaun because leprechauns like gold. Is that evidence of leprechauns? Yeah, no. Um, so so if, if, you can, if you can show that, if, if there was actually a reason to believe that that, that it's more likely that there'll be gold in the house if there's a leprechaun than it's falsehood. I'm not sure how you would make that argument, but let's suppose that you make the argument. Then, then that would be evidence, but it, it wouldn't be sufficient evidence to conclude that, lepre, that there's a leprechaun in the basement. And that's because, right. but that's because we have to, uh, the, the strength of evidence must always be, um, is, is always relative to the prior probability, right? So the prior probability is the probability just given the background information. Given that we don't have any independent reason to believe that there are leprechauns that exist, and we have independent reason to believe that there could be other plausible explanations for why there's gold in your house. Um, and then that, is only, that would only be very, at best very weak evidence if you could show that there is some sort of link between leprechauns and gold in your house. Right, which is why I consider your entire methodology flawed here because you're saying, well, because it would be evidence. It would be evidence of leprechauns because we have there's gold in the house and under the hypothesis that leprechauns exist and like gold, that would increase the likelihood that there would be gold in the house. Yes. That's not the way we should assess evidence. That is a very faulty way to assess evidence because you're not including the alternatives within the theory. You're just assessing every single individual theory on its own merits without including the alternatives. So to include the alternatives, we'd have to include, like in the case of a Jesus, if we want to accept this methodology as counting for evidence, then we can infer any collection of past events from the Bible and combine them in any way we want and infer that 
those events would be likely to happen to what have like after Jesus. So we, we see lots of killing in the Bible. God is a mass murderer. Um, if we anger God, he will mass murder us. We anger God, he mass murders us. Therefore, that would be that would also be evidence of a God given your methodology. So again, the point here is that your methodology is is bad because you're only assessing the positives and not the negatives, the hits and not the misses. You're cherry picking. Oh, yeah, you're I do, saying I do that's the negatives. Um, and uh, I, I just now can't get into it in the, in the scope of my statement. But was that a um, minute or time? I think we've got a minute. Okay. Um, and, and and in in regards to prior probability, I, I would argue that the prior probability is of Jesus fulfilling a prophecy is significantly increased by the independent reason we have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and vice versa. It's a two way thing. The fulfillment of prophecy raises the prior probability of the resurrection, and the evidence for the resurrection increases the prior probability of fulfillment of prophecy as well. Right. So my question here was that given every single hypothetical of we expect this of God's nature in the past, we look at the Old Testament, we find a pattern in God's nature of what he does and infer from that pattern he's going to do something in the future and he does something in the future because his nature, he has previously done something similar. That would also be evidence. Every single case would be evidence given your system, correct? Like God kills people. He's going to kill people in the future. That if it happens, that would be evidence too, because it would be expected. Uh, it, it could be some evidence depending on particulars of the case. Uh, it would need to see Sorry, the particulars. Yeah. Evidence Sorry, I could cut in there. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dr. Malachi. Um, and that's the end of the cross-examination session. And we'll now go to the second last session, that is the conclusions. I'll pass the time to Dr. Malachi for, for eight minutes. And um, you may conclude. I'll start the timer on your first word. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank and um, explain apologetics for organizing this event and also Tom for agreeing to participate and for the uh, engaging discussion. I'm, I'm sorry that um, unfortunately Tom doesn't um, uh, understand the probability theory behind uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying, but the, um, it's, um, if, if, if people want to have more detail on this, I've written an article, um, uh, two articles actually, where I talk about um, the, and, um, the, the argument from field prophecy and the argument from field prophecy and why the evidence of fulfilled prophecy is piece for piece of greater evidential weight than apparently failed instances of prophecy. Um, so that, that's just mathematically demonstrable. Um, and because there are, there are very often alternative interpretations which are at least plausible of, failed, um, of, of apparently failed prophecies. Now, in regards to um, um, the, the, the evidence, uh, just to remind you of some of the points that I brought up in my opening statement, I brought up the um, the um, I, I couched my argument in terms of Bayesian probability theory, um, and I proposed to quantify evidence in terms of this likelihood ratio, the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis, and probability of that same evidence given the concept of the hypothesis. Um, and I pointed out that I don't need to have certainty in the um, in the interpretation of, of the text or the or certainty in the fulfillment coming true on the hypothesis of Christianity in order for it to carry evidential value. Um, so the, um, the probability of the correctness of my interpretation of the text doesn't need to be close to one in order for a prophecy to carry evidential weight. Um, and I gave um, six examples. Um, I gave um, the instance of Jesus' death at Passover, which seems to be more um, um, expected given Christianity than given falsehood. Even if it's not expected given Christianity, it's still more expected given Christianity than given the falsehood. Um, I argued that um, from Psalm 22, Jesus' crucifixion, um, and uh, Tom John points out that that each of these points in, in individually is not of very great weight, but it's, it's reading the text cumulatively that um, that the weight that the text taken as a whole points uh, holistically to uh, something that very much resembles crucifixion scene. There's also reasons for thinking this text is probably messianic, and it's not just Christian interpreters that have taken it as messianic, but there are also ancient Jewish interpreters who also have taken Psalm 22 to be messianic in nature um, as well, <clears throat> and. Um, the, this, the psalm ends with um, um, all people coming to um, re and recognize and revere the God of Israel as a result of the, of the suffering of this individual in Psalm 22. And there doesn't seem to be any incident or episode in the life of Jesus, in the life of David, which fulfills um, this, this text in Psalm 22. Um, and I, I also pointed to the intertextuality with Isaiah's language in the Zephyr 3 as well. Um, so the fact that Jesus is crucified, again, is not at all sufficient to confirm Christianity is true, but it is somewhat more um, expected given Christianity and given the positive Christianity. And so um, it carries evidential value. 
Uh, Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, I think, is is also carried over in Shabbat. I actually underestimated the, uh, I actually deliberately underestimated the base factor in order to account for the fact that we don't have certainty that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but I think that the evidence suggests that it's at least more likely than not. Um, I, I pointed out that the spread of Christianity points uh, to uh, the truth of Christianity, and, and John Jump mentioned in his uh, rebuttal that other religions also also claim this, and, and this is true. But um, one, but this is something which the, the probability of given Christianity appears to be very, very close to one because of its prediction in this text, like Isaiah 49, Isaiah 42, um, Jesus' own words in, in, Matthew, um, in, in Matthew 24, verse 14. And so um, given Christianity, this is something which is highly probable. But given the persecution of early Christians in the first uh, few centuries of the Christian movement, uh, this is something which seems to have been very, um, is very surprising given the falsehood of Christianity um, until 312 AD when Constantine converted in the Edict of Milan 313, which guaranteed religious freedom. Um, and then Christianity in 380 became um, under Theodosius the first state religion of the empire, the Edict of Thessalonica. That's something that seems to be very improbable given the falsehood of Christianity, but highly probable given the truth of Christianity. And I think that a base factor of 100 for that is quite conservative. Um, and I also pointed out that Jesus was Jewish, and of course, Tom said he wasn't impressed with that. And of course, as, as I said, this is not, uh, the, one single example is not sufficient to, to, to rest the weight of the case on, but it's the, all of the evidence taken cumulatively, taken collectively, taken together, that, um, that points to, to um, Jesus' um, messianic identity. Um, and I assigned a very conservative base factor of 10 for that, which I think is reasonable. And the fact that um, the disruption of the Jewish temple in AD 70, again, is something which um, um, is, um, is not altogether implausible given the positive Christianity, but it's, it's somewhat, it's at least, um, it's, it's very expected given the truth of Christianity, but very improbable given, but somewhat improbable given the positive Christianity. So, um, um, and also Jesus himself in Mark 13 predicts that the temple will be torn down. And I would argue that Mark is written pre-70 AD as well. So um, I think that um, a base factor of 10 is quite reasonable uh, for that one. Um, and so that took our cumulative base factor to 10 billion. And um, so in other words, uh, given the assumptions I'm making about the relative weight of each piece of evidence, um, um, and if you, if you disagree with those assumptions, then feel free to put your own um, numbers there and to do your own calculation. Uh, but given those assumptions I made, this evidence is 10 times more likely if Christianity is true than if it's false. Um, and then we can try to um, uh, back solve for the prior to work out how low would the prior probability need to be in order to overcome that evidence. And I showed that even if the prior probability is as low as 100 million, that leads us to a zero probability still 0 0.99 for hypothesis being true. Um, and uh, I would argue that the, um, um, and, and of, of course that that's only part of the evidence that we considered. There's other examples that would take the, the, um, the, base factor even higher still if we had more time to cons consider more examples. And so this sort of evidence um, uh, considered cumulatively then significantly increases the probability of Jesus' resurrection. And um, um, you often hear from, from skeptics that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And this is one way that you can combat that, that claim by pointing out that, uh, that the, the um, although the um, prior probability of any Joe Blow selected a random the population rising from the dead um, is astronomically small. It doesn't follow that the prior probability of Jesus and Nazareth specifically rising from the dead is of similar evidential, uh, is of a similar, uh, is a similarly small prior probability because um, if, if we have independent reason to believe that God plausibly has motivation to raise Jesus and Nazareth specifically from the dead, then the prior probability is higher. And this sort of um, evidence from messianic prophecy um, helps us to. Um, to increase the prior probability because it shows that we have independent reason to believe that God has plausible motivation for raising Jesus from the dead. And also the evidence for the resurrection, um, all, which I've elaborated on elsewhere, also significantly increases the prior probability of Jesus being the Messiah and therefore it's one the prophecy. So it works uh, both ways. And um, I think that um, when you take the case for the resurrection together with Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy and you take those um, Cumulatively, it points very powerfully to the uh, the truth of um, the Christian faith. So I'll finish there and hand over to for Tom to Tom for his closing statement. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. McClatchy. I'll pass the time now to Tom for eight minutes closing statement. 
Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to come here and talk. I really enjoy talking with you guys, as always. Um, as I showed in my opening, that in order for something to count as a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy, it needs to be counted as a prophecy. You need to actually say, this is something that will happen in the future. And it needs to be said that it's going to happen to the Messiah. Otherwise, it's just a vague story that you can interpret in any way you want, just like all the other vague stories. And simply cherry picking the stories that seem to fit this, the uh, narrative that you like isn't evidence, it's just cherry picking. Uh, based on Jonathan's peculiar definition of evidence, the, the fact that gold is in the house is evidence of leprechauns, the fact that something you could, just anything you could infer, like lightning happens would be evidence of Thor, just any of the most general kinds of connections would count as evidence. That is the not a good way to assess evidence because, again, you can just cherry pick any instances you want and say it would be evidence of your preferred hypothesis with discounting all the, the disconfirming evidence. You have to assert the alternative hypotheses and see which one is actually better in that case. The fact that lightning is produced by electromagnetism and particles rubbing in the clouds is a much better explanation. So the fact that evidence lightning occurs is not evidence of Thor. It's just zero evidence of Thor because an alternative hypothesis explains it better. So using this Bayesian epistemology root can make it seem like some particular thing may be evidence because the definition of evidence is so lenient that it could apply to literally anything like gold being in a house of, is evidence of leprechauns. Therefore, when we assess evidence in the reasonable way, saying well, which is the more plausible hypothesis here, the idea that vague stories in a book somehow correlate to the preferred narrative is the less supported hypothesis than that it's just a bunch of vague stories and you cherry pick the ones that fit. Just So that would be the bunch of vague stories, you cherry pick the one that fits would be like particles rubbing together produce lightning and this story actually corresponds to Jesus would be like Thor created lightning. The more plausible hypothesis is that there's a whole bunch of stories in there and you just pick the ones that fit. And so most of the examples Jonathan listed can be seen as just cherry picking in that way. There wasn't very any good predictions. Like a good prediction is like the one from Hinduism that predicts the uh, age of the earth was 4.3 billion years old. That's a really good prediction. It's very accurate. It's very precise. Could it be interpreted in different ways? Everything can be interpreted in different ways. But the most reasonable interpretation is, is that in Hinduism, the earth was 4.3 billion years old, which is an extremely accurate, extremely precise prediction. That is real evidence. That's what real evidence looks like. None of the prophecies that Jonathan mentioned even come close to that. And even with that prediction, it's not enough to support the conclusion that uh, Hinduism is true because you would, all of the things that it says that are not true. So the fact that even if you had a very, very good prediction, which uh, Jonathan does not have or did not provide, wouldn't still would not be sufficient evidence to conclude Jesus was the Messiah or created the universe. You would need something extremely profound for that, which it cannot be found in the Bible. And I will conclude there. Thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks to both speakers for the brevity in saving us a lot of time for the next session. That is the Q and A. So um, please, if you have not already, or even if you have sent some, feel free to send some more, send your questions through Slido. Um, Ezra has posted the link in the Zoom chat already. Um, there are some questions now, and the way it works is I'll read out the questions that Ezra and Marcus select, and I'll direct them to the relevant speaker according to um, the name stated in the question. So um, first, the first question that we have is directed to Tom. So it, the first question asks, Tom, you said not all prophecies were fulfilled in the Old Testament. Prophecy is predictive in nature, and that doesn't mean it will be fulfilled simultaneously. How then can we explain that almost 80% of the Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus? They weren't. It's just false. You're just cherry picking data that seems to fit. It's actually the vast majority of prophecies don't fit Jesus. The ones that specifically say the Messiah will do X, Jesus fails on the vast majority of them, like be the king of Israel. Didn't happen. The reason Jews didn't become Christian was because Jesus fails the vast majority of the prophecies. So it's very clear to see that he didn't. It's just, it's just, it's a Christian myth that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies in the way he did. The academic sources disagree completely. The, the academics in history, the New Testament, Old Testament scholarship say that he didn't. The vast majority of historians say he didn't. It's a Christian myth that he did. 
Thanks, Tom. Um, we have a second question also directed to Tom. So, Tom, this question asks, would miracles, and he defines miracles, he gives examples of miracles such as instant growth, regrowth of intestines or healing of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, be indications of supernatural activity? Uh, possibly depends on, like if you make a prediction, if you pray to a God and say, every time I pray to a God, it will heal intestines or it will heal intestines at a higher rate than chance, then yes. The fact that natural things occur, there is a natural phenomenon of healing in people at a certain rate. People get healed from, from biological reasons that we don't understand all the time. And that would not be evidence of the supernatural just because we can't explain it yet. The fact that something occurs that we can't explain isn't evidence of the supernatural. It's evidence of something we can't explain. In order to, for it to be evidence of the supernatural, you would then need to say, I have this methodology that can show why it happens in some cases more than others. So I could say, if we pray to God and for the intestines to heal, and it happens at a higher rate when we pray to God than when we don't, then it would be evidence of the supernatural. But just the fact that it happens isn't evidence of anything. It's just something we can't explain yet. Thanks, Tom. Hmm. Um, just another reminder to send questions that you would like answered to Slido. There's still a lot of room for questions and a fair amount of time for it. And if anyone wants to... Um, if anyone wants to just open your mic and ask you, feel free to, anyone in the chat. I'm going once, going twice. Uh, yeah, I have a question actually. Um... Isn't isn't um, the science the science of the gaps a bias? How can we how how can we how can we accept that the origin of the world, uh, you know, um, is 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 definitely ascribed to just naturalistic causes instead of the supernatural causes? How can we say with certainty? that everything is natural, that the, the, cause there, there's an argument one that says the cause of the universe is non-spatial, is non-temporal, and it's non, uh, what, what's, what's the last one? It's non-physical. So how, how are you so sure that science will explain everything just given enough time this is up as opposed to the god of the gaps argument yeah yeah so there the difference between the god of the gaps and the science of the gaps is called induction so if you say if you see white goose, white goose, white goose, white goose, white goose, and you see a gap, like what's in the gap? If you say it's a black goose, that's a black goose of the gaps because there's there's no evidence of black geese. You're just saying, well, there's a hole there and we don't know what it is yet. Therefore, it could be black. We, we don't know. Could be black. That's a black goose of the gaps. But if you say it's a white goose, that's not a white goose of the gaps. That's just induction. You're just saying, well, all of the geese we've seen are white. The next one's probably going to be white. Science works the same way. So all of the things we've ever solved throughout human history ever have all been solved by science, not religion, not the supernatural. There's the supernatural solved nothing. So every discovery we've made has been natural, 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 natural. And so if we see a blank of something we don't know yet, it's reasonable to infer it's, it's going to be natural. It's unreasonable. It's a God of the gaps fallacy to include it's going to be supernatural because there's no independent prior evidence that the supernatural could fill the gap. It's just we don't know what's there yet. It could be supernatural. So the science of the gaps is just called induction. It's a reasonable argument. You should every time make it because it's justified. Um, you also mentioned the origin of the universe, spaceless, timeless, and material. So right now, the most supported hypotheses in cosmology and physics are that 
space-time is emergent from something more fundamental. It's not, it's a natural thing. There is a natural thing that exists independent of space and time and matter, and it created space and time and matter. It's a quantum field of some kind. Um, these quantum fields have significantly more evidence than any supernatural properties. Every single part of the mathematical equations for these theories has been verified. So like the multiverse hypothesis, just to pick one, is a combination of early universe inflation, which was demonstrated through Guth's early, early, early universe inflation predictions about the cosmic microwave background, which were discovered to be correct, and vacuum states, which were discovered in the Casimir effect. Those two, the mathematical equations and those two things combined together get you the multiverse to the multiverse hypothesis. Everything, every part of the multiverse hypothesis has been confirmed, even though the com combination itself has not been confirmed, as opposed to the supernatural hypothesis, which has no parts has been confirmed. There's no property of soul, no property of free will, no property of all powerful, all knowing, all loving, uh, those things, there's no evidence of any of those things. Whereas there is extremely good evidence for every one of the parts of the physics theories. And so for the exact same reason as the science of the gaps isn't a fallacy, it's more reasonable to infer that the origin of the universe will be answered by physics rather than a unsupported supernatural being. Thanks, Tom. Um, apologies for my own lack of clarification. For future questions, kindly um, direct the question towards the speaker. But that's a really good question. And I, so I just want to check. Um, does Dr. Malachi want to respond to Christopher's question as well? Uh, to that previous one? Um, yeah, um, when it comes to um, the things like the origins of life, I mean, and, and the origins of biological complexity, I, I think that... Um, we're, we're not invoking God of the gaps argument, right? We're inferring to the best explanation that that sort of feature, namely information content or um, irreducibly complex nanotechnology where there's a higher level objective being accomplished by numerous sub-functions that are together contributing to that higher level objective. That sort of feature is, is not at all unsurprising given the hypothesis of design, but it's very surprising given the falsehood of design. And therefore it, it constitutes positive confirming evidence for the design hypothesis um, and, uh, um, and when, when it comes to, uh, e explaining, um, th that sort of feature of the world, that this, the sort of feature that, that we habitually associate with conscious activity, that is just the point where all origins of life theories habitually uh, universally break down. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, does Tom, is Tom someone, is Tom an atheist that says that there's no evidence for God, or do you think that there's evidence but just not sufficient in your assessment? Uh, the way I define evidence is with including the alternatives. And so it would not count as evidence under my epistemology, but I don't define evidence the same way you do. So I don't just count anything that would be true if the hypothesis is true. I don't count that as evidence. I would say it's only evidence if it's the most likely thing given all the hypotheses. So for example, your fine tuning argument, if there is a determining law of physics that causes all of the forces to be uh, set as what they are, that would in, based on your definition of evidence, be equally as supported as confirmatory evidence of this hypothesis. The fine tuning would be confirmatory evidence of this hypothesis as well as design, because all that it takes to count as evidence under your hypothesis is that if this theory is true, is this what we would expect? So if we expect that there is a specific, a single law of nature that inter intertwines all of the physics, physical forces to make them what they are, if we expect this to be true, we would see these physical forces. We see these physical forces. Therefore, that would also be evidence given your definition. So my definition is a little more thorough than that. I say that in order for it to count as evidence, you would have to show that it's the more plausible explanation of this phenomenon, not just it can be explained by the phenomenon or can just, explain the phenomenon. Just to clarify, um, uh, my definition of, of evidence is that, um, that something is evidence for your hypothesis if and only if the probability of that evidence is greater given the hypothesis, given the falsehood. So even if it's expected given the hypothesis, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be evidence if it's equally well expected given the falsehood of that hypothesis. Um, so it's a little more nuanced than that. Right, right. And I'm claiming that my definition is not a comparison between the truth of if what would you expect see, given the hypothesis versus not the hypothesis, but what we, what we would given that hypothesis versus alternative hypotheses. So, so mine if, is, well, like if your definition is true, if it's, if this thing is true, if this thing exists, we would expect to see some cause. And if this thing literally doesn't exist, would we expect to see the cause? No. So it's just claiming that there is, a, if there is a leprechaun, we would expect gold. 
We see gold, therefore that's evidence of a leprechaun. If we see no leprechaun, would we expect to see gold? Well, no, because we're not positing anything there. But if we posit something else there, like gold is really common, people like gold, and what is the probability we would expect to see gold in someone's house, given the fact that it's pretty common and people can afford it. And then we compare those two hypotheses, people like gold, and so they buy it versus leprechaun. I would say now, since the evidence weighs heavily in favor of the people like gold, it is therefore evidence against the leprechaun, not for it. Whereas given your hypothesis, you're only comparing leprechaun versus no leprechaun. I'm comparing well, leprechaun versus people like gold. But I mean, we have to take into consideration the prior probability and the prior probability, I think we'll both agree, is, is greater for alternative hypothesis than for the leprechaun hypothesis. Um, and that's, that's why we favor alternative hypotheses. Uh, right, but I include that into my epistemology, into the analysis. I say, given the prior probability, we can we can already conclude that the leprechaun, this is evidence against the leprechaun, not for the leprechaun. Whereas in yours, since you're assessing it simply based on the fact of leprechaun versus no leprechaun, and I'm ass assessing it leprechaun versus people like gold, uh, my standard of evidence is a little more thorough. Okay. So, well, last question sorry, here. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to have to intervene here because we have a couple more questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, but we have another question for Tom, and this is in reference to um, one of the statements you made about Jesus, about the soldiers having crucified Jesus and took his garments and di divided them. Um, this the questioner asked that didn't you know that this piece of evidence that is soldiers crucifying Jesus took his garments and divided them is also quoted in the New Testament, and he cites several verses such as John nineteen verse twenty three to twenty four. Also, Matthew 27 to 35, Mark 15, verse 24, and Luke 23, verse 34. Uh, as far as I know, none of those include casting lots. Didn't happen. Like in, in the Psalms 22 uh, example that Jonathan listed, it explicitly says, they took my clothes and cast lots to give them away. Do any of those include casting lots? The answer is no. Oh, all right. And actually, the Actually, the references mentioned casting lots. You have to check to believe it. Uh, maybe, Brendan, you can give the references again. All right. Um, yeah, the references are John 19, verse 23 to 24, Matthew 27, verse, 30, uh, verse 35, uh, Mark 15, verse 24, and Luke 23, verse 34. All the four references mentioned casting lots. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any of them. I'm looking, I don't see casting lots. Are you sure you had the right references? Like the Psalms 22 says casting lots. So Tom's actually mistaken here. Um, Matthew 27, 35, when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Mark 15, 24, and they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what you should take. Um, so, All right, fair uh, enough. I can, I can grant I'm wrong on that one. I see it now. Yeah. Um, All right, thanks. Also, also John 19, 24 as well. Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. Yeah. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. McClatchy, and thanks, um, Oliver. Um, yeah, we just have another question for Tom as well. Um, the questioner asks, you disagreed with the argument that the failed prophecies are just yet to are just yet to fulfill prophecies, as argued by John and other Christians. But you also argued that science can explain certain things given sufficient time. Isn't that contradictory? No. Um, saying that a guy guesses a number like the lottery and he gets it wrong for like every lottery and you can say, no, he's probably gonna be right in the future. That's bad evidence. Science, which gets it right every single time, it's told us everything about the world that we know with high probability, saying it's going to get it right is, is reasonable. So since the Bible has gotten pretty much everything wrong, um, it's more reasonable to infer it's like the guy who's just guessing randomly and keeps getting it wrong. So no, it's they're not in any way analogous. A science textbook inferring the science is true is, is reasonable. Inferring the Bible is true is unreasonable. Like most of the characters in the Bible didn't exist. Abraham didn't exist. Moses didn't exist. Cain and Abel didn't exist. Most of the stories in the Bible are false um, as accepted by the vast majority of historians. This assuming that it would be true, given the fact that the vast majority of it is false, would be unreasonable. Assuming science is true is extremely reasonable. All right, thanks, Tom. 
Hmm. Um, does anyone have any further questions, whether they'd like to unmute and ask directing the question to the speaker or whether they would like to ask on Slido? Hmm. Going once. Hey, Tom, good to see you again. Hey. Hey, Mark here. Uh, I had I have longer hair than the last time we met. Good to see you again. <laughs> Um, yeah, I remember you were in the background was the Buddhist temple, I think. Very yes, that's temple. right. Yeah, yeah. So um, the other guy that looks like Jesus was actually the Buddhist, and I was looking like a Buddhist, but I was actually the Christian. Yeah, that was the one. Um, just, uh, just a question, because you were you were mentioning that um, uh, that you, that you noticed that there are certain like messianic prophecies that uh, in, your, in your either in your opinion or in other people's inter interpretation, uh, Jesus has failed. Uh, so I'm curious to know um, who. Uh, who do you usually refer? Who do you usually refer to to define which ones are messianic prophecies and which ones not? And how do you categorize whether something has failed or passed? You know, do you have do you have a source that you can share? Because I'm quite curious as to as to the source of your knowledge, other than that almighty lazy boy chair of yours that you're sitting on. Yeah, I just asked the Jews, so I just uh, emailed some Jewish scholars and they gave me a list. So I mean, I can send you their work or something if you email me after. Okay. Do you mind if I follow up the question? Sure. Uh, Judaism has has had an evolution uh, from first temple to second temple to even during the Roman times. Uh, so how how can you be sure that their current interpretation in light of Jesus Messiah uh, is consistent with, their, with is consistent with what they were even think in term, in terms of time of Solomon? Because um, they because it is quite clear that the the Jews just didn't want Jesus to be Messiah simply because they didn't like him. So they so there's already a bias towards that in the first place. Would you think? Uh, not really. So I think that the the contemporary Jewish interpretation and the past Jewish interpretation was that the Messiah was going to come back and actually rule Israel and take over with the sword and actually literally reign. I'm pretty sure that was the interpretation back then and today. That was that's kind of the consensus. Uh, other than like I, I'm not an expert on Jewish scholarship, so I can't give every single example. But I'm pretty sure that's a, that's a pretty easy one to go to that the contemporary understanding is probably the same as the past one. Okay, cool, cool. All right, thanks, Mark. How many questions again going once? Going twice? Okay, so I'll pass the time back to Ezra. And thank you so much to both um, Tom and Dr. McClatchy. Um, and yeah, um, take care, everyone, and see you soon. Amazing. Thank you, Brendan, and thank you to our debaters. And it's been a wonderful debate. And uh, just a quick announcement, we're going to have an after party right after this, and it will be on a Clubhouse app at 11 p.m. If you have a Clubhouse app on your phone, it will still be up after this. Join us for the very last time as we dissect, review, and discuss this debate. And on behalf of Explain Apologetics, we would like to thank all of you for being part of this conference and also for being part of this debate. And we hope to see you again for our next event or next year at this very conference. So good night and have a good weekend. See you.